The BBC presents The Strange and the Sinister, the second of four stories of the supernatural by Professor William Croft Dickinson. Today's story opens in the comfort of the University Common Room and is called Let the Dead Bury Their Dead. Has an archaeologist any qualms when he's excavating an early burial? asked Drummond, turning to our professor of prehistory. Do the bones ever give you the creeps? Abercrombie paused before answering. Quite a long pause. Uh, sometimes they do, he conceded at last. I could tell you of an experience I had myself when I was still a young lecturer. And to be frank, that's why I've concentrated on Iron Age forts. Even now, I shrink from graves of any kind. We all waited expectantly. Well, seems to be no reason why I shouldn't tell you. As I said, I was a young lecturer, a mere beginner, when one day, to my utter surprise, I received a letter from Hawthorne inviting me to join him in the excavation of a group of early Bronze Age burials. Well, naturally, I accepted at once. Hawthorne was a brilliant archaeologist. Here was my chance. I was met by Hawthorne at a lonely wayside station. He loaded my things onto an old army truck and off we drove. But after his first greeting, I found him very silent and wondered at it. Before long, we left the main road and followed a rough track that took us into the isolation of a bleak and desolate land. Perhaps half an hour later, we reached Hawthorne's tent. All around lay one vast expanse of heather, bog, and tussocky grass, studded here and there with the rough shapes of massive boulders, which, in the half-light of the evening, looked like huge monsters crouching and ready to spring. A few black-faced sheep moving and nibbling amongst them were oddly reassuring. Oh, I had no idea you was as isolated as this. You must have felt pretty lonely, eh? Yes, Hawthorne answered slowly, and then... That's why I've asked you to come. Though I need your help, too. There are probably ten or a dozen burials. They all seem to be near the surface, but, well, two workers are better than one. But did you come here all by yourself? I persisted. Surely you had someone with you at the start. I had an idea that he glanced at me sideways and then looked away. Chalmers was with me for a while. In fact, he came with me, but he had to go away. So I wrote to you. Oh, I'm glad you did, I answered. I've seen two or three isolated graves, but I've never seen a collective group of them. It is a desolate place, I continued, looking at the wild expanse round us. There was a pause. Yes, it's desolate, he said. And the only living soul I've met is a shepherd. He comes to see me every day. Every day, almost as though wanting to be sure I'm still alive. And I am still alive, he answered fiercely. I looked at him in astonishment. I'm sorry, he said, and his voice was normal again. It's my nerves. This, this place is becoming too much for me. Look, bring your traps into the tent. When we've had something to eat, I'll make my confession. Soon we were sitting at the table of an upturned box and consuming an excellent cold supper. The meal over, we put the dishes and the grass outside. They could be washed in the morning. Then we closed the flap of the tent and sat in our respective camp beds and literally looked at one another. Do you mind if we have a drink? Hawthorne asked, breaking the silence. <laughs> Not become a habit, I assure you, but I think it would help me to tell you why I asked you to come. He produced a bottle of whiskey and poured out two quite ordinary tots. I was relieved to notice their moderation. Oh, confusion to our enemies, I said, holding up my glass. And knowledge as to who they are, came his response. I came here just over a fortnight ago, intending to excavate this group of early Bronze Age burials. They're referred to in an old history published about 18... 20, and when I came, I thought I was going to be the first to open them. But I was wrong. He paused there and took another sip at his whiskey. It was the shepherd who told me of the other man, he continued. Apparently, last year, another archaeologist was here and opened two of the graves. 
As soon as I examined the site, I could see that two excavations had been made and then closed in again. But when, as my first task, I reopened the first of those two graves, I didn't like it one little bit. It looked exactly as though the burial had been made last year instead of, well, 3,500 years ago. The bones lay there in perfect position, the usual doubled up posture of a short cyst with the knees drawn up to the chin. But the stones lining the grave and covering it in were not only in perfect position also, but they were new and newly laid. It was a new grave for old bones. In some way at which I cannot even guess, those old bones, dried, shrunk and friable as they were, had been carefully and reverently reburied in a newly made cyst. But who had done it? it was certainly not done by my predecessor on the site. I tell you, he couldn't have done it. But can you imagine my thoughts when I reopened his second excavation and found that that too was a reburial in a newly made grave? You may think you can, but you haven't yet heard what the shepherd said. He poured out another small tot of whiskey and sipped it slowly, forcing himself into composure. You see, the shepherd insists that the place is holy, that no one can desecrate a grave with impunity, however old the grave may be, that the dead still protect the dead, and so forth and so on. He started the very first day I came. He got Chalmers pretty scared, though he didn't leave me then. He repeated it with additions when I'd reopened the first of those two graves. He repeated it with more additions when I'd reopened the second, and was more than a bit scared myself. And then he told me of the other man, how he'd done his best to persuade him to leave the graves alone and to go away, just as he was trying to persuade me to pack up and go away. But the other fellow wouldn't listen, just as I won't listen. So the dead took matters into their own hands. The day after the other fellow had opened the second grave, the shepherd couldn't find him on his daily visit. He was not in his tent, he was not at the site. But he found him in the end, lying by a clump of heather within a stone's throw of the grave he'd desecrated, just lying there, dead. I gave a start. Fairbairn, I said. He nodded. It must have been. I haven't checked up the dates yet, but it was last year that Fairbairn was found dead on some excavation which he was conducting alone, and they never established the cause of death. But I didn't know that it was here on this very site. And you still want to go on? I asked slowly. Yes, he almost shouted. The whole thing must be sheer nonsense. I refuse to let a shepherd's silly talk put me off. In fact, I've already opened the third grave he continued more quietly. I finished the excavation this morning before you arrived. As good a short cyst as you'd ever hope to see, and nothing queer about it either. The stones lining it are as old as the hills, and the skeleton is all tumbled in on itself. I tell you, I shall go on until I've excavated the whole lot, or until something happens to me. He paused there and then went on. But I must have some help. That's why I invited you to join me. Now, I can tell you, I didn't write to you without asking myself again and again whether it was fair of me to bring you here at all. But why me, I asked. Well, he answered slowly, in the first place, I'd been told you'd got good nerves. And in the second place, you've got a medical degree. And if anything should happen to me, well, I'd have a fully qualified doctor on the spot, even if all he could do would be to sign my death certificate. Oh, nonsense, I replied. Though somehow or other that one word didn't sound anything like so convincing as it should have done. But why did Chalmers leave? Huh, poor beggar. That shepherd's talk had got on his nerves. He was looking over his shoulder before we'd finished reopening the first of Fairbairn's two graves. He left when we'd just started in Fairbairn's second excavation. All because a stone fell. He said it was against the law of gravity. He said it must have been pushed, and as I hadn't pushed it, who had? Well, I think I lost my temper. At any rate, off he went. And rather childishly, I refused to drive him to the station, so he just took what he could carry and marched away. But I shall still go on. I've made up my mind. I've roughly filled in those first two graves. Better hide that evidence, whatever it may mean. 
But as I told you, I've opened a third grave, and there's nothing queer about that. You can see it for yourself tomorrow. No new cyst for old bones there. You'll stay to see that one anyway, won't you? Though if, after all you now know, you want to go back home first thing tomorrow morning, I'd be the last to blame you. He added with a ghost of a smile. And I'll drive you back to the station with all your things. Well, of course, there was only one answer to that. But I couldn't help the thought that had his letter told me even a little of all this, I might not have posted my acceptance as quickly as I'd done. Good, he said. We'll look at my third grave and the whole of the site tomorrow morning. And now, let's change the topic. And so for a while we talked of this and that, of archaeological studies in general, a little scandal, a little gossip. And it was after midnight when we both turned in and Hawthorne blew out the lamp. Although our concluding talk had been of other things, that earlier talk still dogged my mind. I lay awake trying to make sense of it all. Had Hawthorne and Chalmers just imagined things? How long I lay awake, I don't know. All I do know is that I fell asleep at last, that I had no bad dreams, and that next morning I awoke in a strange light always caused by the sun shining through tent canvas. I looked at my wristwatch. It said almost 11 o'clock. I sat up at once and looked across the tent to Hawthorne's bed. It was empty. Oh, good fellow. He left me to do the sleeping while he did the chores. I dressed slowly and strolled out of the tent. It was a lovely day. Blazing sun, clear sky, and a refreshing slight northeast wind. Then my eye caught something on the ground just by the tent. Our dirty dishes. Well, at least I could wash those out in the burn. We'd need them for breakfast anyway. Breakfast? I suddenly realised that we ought to have had breakfast long ago. Hawthorne ought to have awakened me. Well, where was Hawthorne? A sentence from our talk flashed through my mind. The dead still protect the dead. And at once, as if in echo, let the dead bury their dead. I was nearly in a panic then, but not quite. Calling myself a fool, I decided that I'd be certain to find Hawthorne at his excavation and probably completely oblivious of the time. I found him. He was lying huddled up beside a newly opened grave. I went down on my knees beside him, but I could find no cause of death. He was quite unmarked. And then, as I bent to lift him up, my glance fell upon that newly opened grave, Hawthorne's third the one he was to show me that very day. Startled, I looked again. For that grave was far different from the description he'd given me only a few hours earlier. The bones lying there were in perfect position, and the stones lining the grave were clean, fresh cut, and newly laid. Let the Dead Bury Their Dead by William Croft Dickinson was read for the BBC by Moultrie Kelsall.